Welcome everyone. My name is Ann Bennett. I'm the Executive Director of the Laurel Historical Society. And I'm very excited that you have joined us tonight for our November webinar. It's part of our fall speaker series. And I am joined tonight by our panelist and speaker for the evening, Julianne Mangin. She is a researcher, a family historian, a genealogist, a cemetery preservationist. Uh, and she's part of the Montgomery History Speakers Bureau. Uh, so if you have not checked uh, Checked out Montgomery History and their virtual offerings, uh, please do so. They're doing some fantastic work in Montgomery County uh, and a lot of their research and programs are not too far away from us in Laurel. So we definitely encourage you to check out our friends over at Montgomery County. Uh, Julianne is a retired librarian and she worked at the Library of Congress for quite a few years. Uh, and she holds a master's degree in library science from Catholic University. And she'll be talking to us tonight on the hidden history of Commonwealth Farm and that's in Colesville, which is actually not too far away from Laurel at all, just kind of across the Montgomery County line there. So I think it's going to be a fascinating talk, and I just uh, encourage you again as we go through our evening, put any questions or comments you have uh, in the chat or the Q&A box, and we will get uh, the questions answered before the end. So uh, you'll hear from me a little bit at the end. Uh, we have some announcements and events coming up that I want to be sure to share with you. Uh, but for now, I am going to pass it over to our speaker, Julianne, uh, and say a virtual welcome to Laurel. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Oh, thanks. This is a pleasure. So do you want me to go ahead and share my screen now? Yeah, I think we can get started. Thank you so much. OK. Whoops, I did that wrong. <laughs> Let me go back. Ah, I'm sorry. I must have. Uh, nope, it looks like you're doing fine. Yeah, we definitely saw your screen. So it looks like. Yeah, but it uh, for some reason uh, it's went. Yeah, um, I'm going to have to. I think I've got a conflict here. Just a second. Let me take care sure. of it. Uh, come on. All right. So. <laughs> I apologize to everyone. You know, you think you know what's going on, and then, no. All right. No, this, so. yep, this will be good. It was. It, I saw a sneak preview in our practice session, and it looked really fascinating. So. Yeah, I think what I did was um, I had the um, thing playing, so it was um, it was reverting to that. So now from the beginning yay okay. looks good definitely all right i apologize to everyone yeah, looks um, good. Thank you. you never know okay so well uh, i'm here to talk to you about the uh, hidden history of commonwealth farm in colesville and it was owned by a woman's commune that was first known as the sanctified sisters and later as the woman's commonwealth of washington and they uh, were formed in Texas in 1875, and then they moved to Washington, D.C. in 1898. In 1903, they bought a farm um, out in Colesville, and they named it Commonwealth Farm. And then in 1905, they opened an inn and restaurant that became a popular spot for motorists uh, and locals, of course, and people as far away as Washington, D.C. Um, during the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. And then by 1947, there were only two women left in the Commonwealth and they sold the farm. And that was in uh, 1947. And then since then, the property has changed hands several times, but it's now owned by Montgomery Parks. Uh, the Women's Commonwealth of Washington was a remarkable group of Texas women who, um, in the late 19th and 20th century, generated a fair amount of press for being uh, independent of men at a time when that was nearly unheard of. Uh, how did they end up in Maryland? And, um, you know, what about Colesville appealed to them? So, um, what I'd like to do next is give you an idea really of how I got started in researching this. And it wasn't really that long ago. In uh, December 2020, um, I was reading a Facebook group that's devoted to Wheaton, Maryland, where I'm from. And somebody posted a picture of this retaining wall that you can see when you're driving on uh, New Hampshire Avenue 
um, headed north. It's on the east side just before you get to Good Hope Road. And so the person was like, does anybody know what this is? So people chimed in and there were uh, some knew that it used to be a nursing home um, and that it had a terrible fire in the 1950s. But there was one person in the group who remembered that it used to be a restaurant because his mother had been a waitress there. And he had said um, that it was run by something called the Commonwealth, which was a group of seniors that banded together for the common good was the way he put it. And I was just intrigued by the idea of a group of unrelated people, you know, taking care of each other in their old age. So I decided I would look into it. The first thing I did uh, to research it was I um, went to Montgomery History and uh, they have uh, the Atlas of Montgomery County, Maryland. Um, and this is a 1948 edition. And in the place where this wall had been, uh, there was this property um, and it, there was this U-shaped, um, sorry, uh, U-shaped driveway uh, sketched in and then these little blocks that indicated buildings and then the words Commonwealth Farm Inn. And it was on um, property owned uh, by Peter Floros. So I went to the county land records and I found that it uh, in 1947, Peter, Peter Flores had bought the property from a group calling themselves the Woman's Commonwealth of Washington, DC and that they had owned the property since 1903. So uh, I was, uh, you know, armed with the um, words and phrases, uh, Commonwealth Farm and Woman's Commonwealth of Washington, D.C. I searched for newspaper articles, uh, maps, deeds, photographs, anything that I could find uh, about the um, Woman's Commonwealth. And here's what I turned up, beginning with how, how it started. Uh, the Commonwealth was started by Martha McWhorter, um, and she was born Martha White in, in Tennessee in 1827. In 1845, she married George McWhorter. They settled in Bell County, Texas in 1855, and then in 1865, they moved to the town of Belton, which was the county seat of uh, Belton. And then one of the things they did when they were in Belton was they started um, a uh, what they called the Union Sunday School, which was a um, was non-sectarian and it served all members of prom Protestant denominations. And uh, that was because there was at the time there were no dedicated church buildings in Belton, so this was a Sunday school for everybody. But in 18, oh, and, and in addition to that, Martha would hold uh, prayer meetings in various homes throughout the town of Belton. But in 1870, the Methodist Church, um, they went and bought, built their own church and they started their own Sunday school just for their members. And even though George and Martha were Methodists themselves, they objected to the idea of, of you know, teaching just to one denomination. And so they began to part ways with the Methodist church. Uh, this, there are some uh, events though that precipitated the founding of uh, the commune that became known as the Woman's Commonwealth. Um, one of them was that in 1866, Martha had a revelation um, that she felt came from God that it was wrong to divide um, Christianity into separate denominations. And um, she also believed that she was sanctified, um, which you know, I'll explain in a little bit. But anyway, another thing that happened was that in 1875, she became estranged from her husband, who didn't share her religious views about sanctification. But in addition to that, she objected to the kind of hold that he held on uh, family finances, and it kind of all came to a head, so they say, in an incident where um, she asked him for $1.50 so she could buy a new pair of slippers, and he balked and asked her why she, whether she really needed them, and then she said from that moment on, she said she wasn't going to ask him for any money for herself or the children and any money she needed, she would get from, you know, selling uh, milk and butter from her cows and eggs from her chickens. So um, I know that sounds like a drastic uh, 
reaction, but it was probably more like the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, so to, to get some background on Martha's side of things, um, you have to understand that, you know, when Martha and George moved to uh, Bell County in 1855, there was like nothing there. It was basically a frontier. And so George and Martha had to both work equally hard to, you know, start a farm, build a home, maintain the home, raise the children and so forth. And um, then on top of that, during the Civil War, um, uh, George decided that he needed to help fight on the wrong side. He, he joined the Confederate Army as a major and he was gone for a couple years, leaving Martha to basically manage his business and, you know, the household affairs and everything. So, you know, given all that she'd done to contribute to the, to the marriage and the family, it, I can understand why she was upset because because he wouldn't give her a dollar fifty for a new pair of slippers, so I'm 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 sympathetic to her objections. So another thing that um, helped precipitate the well, really brought it together was that these issues. Um, she went to her prayer group and talked about her problems with George, and she found out that other members, mostly women, um, had similar problems with their husbands. You know, drunkenness, physical abuse, desertion, and so. Um, one by one, they started cutting themselves off from their marriage, um, and uh, they, um, let's see, I'm sorry. Anyway, uh, what happened next? Let me just talk a little more about their beliefs, um, because that'll help you understand uh, where they were coming from. So the main belief they had was they believed that they were sanctified, they believed in sanctification, which basically means that they uh, were free of sin and they were dedicated to living their life the way God wanted them to and uh, a life without sin. Um, they also uh, were, believed in non-sectarianism. And as I mentioned before, that Martha thought it was wrong to divide Christianity into separate denominations. And she was also quoted once as saying that she thought that theologians were um, the cause of much of the uh, evil and unhappiness in the world. So that's where she was coming from. And then finally, um, she had also believed that um, it was uh, a sin for a sanctified person to be married to or living with a um, unsanctified person. So this is where um, she cut herself off from George and each woman eventually, um, you know, broke up their marriages and some of them even brought some of their children into the commune with them. So they started doing the same thing Martha did, which was they weren't going to take money from their husbands anymore. But now what they were doing is they were pooling their um, money together um, and using it for the common good. So by 1879, uh, the women of the prayer group were essentially self-supporting. And whatever money they raised, like I said, they put it into a common pool, a pool for common use. So there were things like, you know, one of one of them you know, had a wood lot, so they chopped wood and they sold firewood, they wove rugs, um, they opened the laundry, um, and uh, I, this was crazy. This one woman, she learned dentistry. Um, I don't think that she practiced outside of the commune, but it was just another way of them not to depend on people outside their insular group there. Another woman taught herself to make shoes, uh, which I thought was interesting. Um, but some of the women had their own houses and they started using them as communal homes for members of the commune. And then another way of raising money was they would also take on borders in these uh, communal homes. And this evolved into them um, running, starting and running something called the Belton Central Hotel. So um, on the surface, it might appear that the Sanctified Sisters had started a uh, religious commune, but their choice to separate themselves from traditional marriage and organized religion was really a feminist one, considering that these two institutions were dominated by men. And it was also an economic uh, commune and was meant to solve uh, an economic problem, which is that women who divorced were usually, 
you know, found themselves in uh, worse financial uh, circumstances than when they were married. And this way, that wasn't a problem. And finally, as I mentioned, some of these women actually were dealing with domestic abuse. So this commune might be considered an early form of a shelter for battered women. This is a picture of uh, the McWhorter house where George and Martha lived when they were married. And um, after George left home, uh, he, he got an apartment in town or something, but anyway, he was gone. Um, and it was used as a communal home for the sanctified sisters. And the community of Belton was hostile towards them, both because of their religious views and also because of the marriages that had been broken up. And churches turned them out um, accusing them of heresy. Uh, one woman was uh, taken out of the commune and sent to an insane asylum. Uh, and there were two men that had become supporters of uh, the Sanctified Sisters and rented a room in the um, McWhorter house. And one day a mob came and dragged them out of the house and beat them up. And in addition to that, com community members tried to sabotage their hotel business by buttonholing travelers on the street and saying bad things about the hotel. But enough of them managed to make it to the hotel for the sisters to build a reputation for hospitality and fine food. Um, despite the uh, difficulties, difficulties they endured, the uh, sanctified sisters persisted in their religious and uh, financial endeavors. Um, they gave money to the railroad to induce it to uh, send a spur out to Belton. Uh, which benefited their business, but not only that, they benefited other businesses in town. Uh, they financed an opera house. Um, they started the town's first public library. So obviously they were doing financially very well on their own. And they became so successful that in 1894, uh, the local board of trade asked Martha McWhorter to be a member. Articles about the commune appeared all over the United States. Um, a group of women living independently of men was fascinating material in those days. So here's some samples of some articles I found from all over. Uh, they're not nice, are they? <laughs> anyway. Um, the thing is that the Sanctified Sisters peaked at 50 members in 1880. So it's really amazing the amount of press they generated considering they weren't really that large. Around 1898, um, they began to divest their Texas holdings and um, to finance a move to Washington, DC. Uh, the community that had once been hostile to them actually begged them to stay. Uh, but um, like many of their decisions, uh, it, it was uh, divinely uh, ordered for them to move, so they went. Um, anyway, they were attracted to Washington because of the cultural opportunities there, and also it was a beautiful city. And um, the aging first generation of of the Commonwealth members um, wanted a cooler climate to retire in. But they also thought that this might, um, this move might ease the restlessness of the younger, you know, second generation who were children when they joined um, the Commonwealth with their, with their mothers and, you know, hadn't really made a choice. So uh, at this point, the sisters uh, numbered 23 women. And once in Washington, they bought this fine house uh, on 1437 Kennesaw Avenue Northwest in the Mount Pleasant neighborhood of Washington, DC. The lot that the house was on was two thirds of an acre. So it was um, large enough for them to start a garden that um, the Washington Post referred to as a tiny farm. And uh, they, uh, they also had cows to, um, for milk and butter. And in their leisure time uh, in Washington, they, um, they read, they painted, they did needlework, um, they attended concerts and lectures, they observed sessions of Congress, uh, visited libraries, uh, but they also um, used their home to host lectures um, lecturers who 
supported views that they were interested in, such as uh, su women's suffrage and uh, socialism. And just a little side note, if you try to find Kennesaw Avenue in Washington, DC, um, you won't find it because it was renamed Irving Street. Uh, so here's a picture of the Women's Commonwealth. Um, in 1903, the women uh, formalized their beliefs into a constitution with bylaws. And the first thing they did was it, it established their official name as the Woman's Commonwealth of Washington. And they had never liked the name Sanctified Sisters, which was a name that was put on them by outsiders. Among themselves, they referred to their group as the church and they referred to each other as sister. Uh, property and other assets were to be held in you know, as communal assets and labor uh, was to be divided equally. The members agreed to be governed by both a board of uh, trustees and a board of directors. And of course, they all agreed to live a celibate life. When the Women's Commonwealth arrived in Washington, they came under um, more scrutiny from the press. Um, these, though, don't seem as uh, harsh as the first few I showed you. And this one, um, I like this one because it's got this um, lovely Art Nouveau style layout. Um, but the press coverage started turning negative when one of the younger members uh, decided to leave to get married. And uh, this article, uh, article in the Washington Times, it's like it was typical of the time sensationalized their vow of celibacy as man hating. And uh, I, I don't know if you can see it because it's tiny print, but the caption to the picture of the house, it says the house of the man haters. So uh, there you go. And then uh, when one of the members, Susie Carter, got a government job, somehow word got out that she belonged to a commune of celibate women. So the story was covered in strikingly different ways by the Washington Post and the Washington Times. So here's uh, the Washington Post article, and it was fairly straightforward and not inflammatory, but um, then there was the Washington Times. Washington sanctified sisterhood invades the government service. And then uh, below it says, get married to a man? Never, nothing but celibacy for the women of this sect, which makes its home in Washington. So anyway, so here's the point in the story where we get to Colesville. Um, in 1903, uh, the Woman's Commonwealth purchased 119 acres uh, from Charles Collingrew and called the property Commonwealth Farm. And here's an 1894, this is a detail from an 1894 map of the area. And this road here is called, in the map it's called Ashton and Colesville Pike. Eventually it was called um, Colesville Road, but then later uh, that name was transferred to another road, and this is actually what we know now as um, New Hampshire Avenue. Now, here is a Bonifant Road coming in from the west, and it takes a sharp turn and then hits New Hampshire Avenue, or the Pike, as it was called at the time. And then on the other side, this is Good Hope Road, and it makes another sharp angle and goes on up. So the Commonwealth Farm was basically in this area, the northeast corner of that intersection. So it goes around this area I'm tracing that used to be owned by Charles Collingrew. And uh, just so you know, right here, judging by the presence of this church and this school, there was at the time uh, and still now is uh, an African-American community called Good Hope. Now here's a modern map and uh, Today, due to the rerouting of uh, Bonifant Road and Good Hope Road, um, most of what was Commonwealth Farm is on the southeast intersection, and it goes down here. 
And as you can see now there's development here, but uh, most of this now is parkland. And there's a little piece of what was uh, Commonwealth Farm north of Good Hope Road. And over here is where Peachwood Neighborhood Park is. And so that's where what it's like today. Another interesting thing that I found to look at were aerial photographs. So this one's from 2017. And it shows the property to be heavily wooded still. And uh, again, it's this little piece above and then all the way around here is where Commonwealth Farm used to be. And here's an aerial photo from 1951 and the um, by that time, the Commonwealth was gone. This was during the period that it was a nursing home. But as you can see, it's, it's mo mostly like agricultural fields. So they ran this pretty big farm here. And this little area here is where they had their inn and restaurant. And at the time of this photo, of course, it was the nursing home. Um, so the remaining uh, members of the Women's Commonwealth uh, seem more comfortable in a rural environment and you know, they, they thrive there away from the city. Martha McWhorter spent the last year of her life on the farm in Colesville and she was reported, it was reported that she was delighted with it. Um, the women raised cows, pigs, chickens, and ducks, and they grew crops such as corn and wheat and vegetables. There were 1,000 um, fruit bearing trees at one point, and um, they had a wagon that they used to sell produce locally, but they also used the wagon so that they still owned the house in um, Washington, D.C., which they also took in borders there. So. Um, they use the wagon to um, transport um, fruits and vegetables and other products back and forth there. In 1905, they opened an inn and restaurant though at, at Colesville. Commonwealth Farm was mentioned briefly in a rural survey in Maryland. Um, and this is the entirety of what they said about Commonwealth Farm. But this always gets me. It is rumored that they get on entirely without masculine counsel or assistance. Imagine that. So Martha McWhorter, um, she died at the farm in 1904, after which the uh, Commonwealth, um, the numbers declined. And there are a few possible reasons. Um, one of them was, of course, um, that they didn't recruit new members. You know, the older generation was dying off and they, they never proselytized or actively recruited members. And if you look at the constitution, there was a high bar for joining that was meant to preserve the delicate balance that had kept things working uh, for so long. Uh, the, the younger generation was disenchanted with the restrictions of the commune. Um, by coming to Washington, they'd become aware of opportunities such as uh, careers outside the job or higher education. And obviously some of them, you know, wanted to marry and have children. And there were members also that wanted to control their own money, which wasn't allowed under the Commonwealth's constitution. So the remaining women were uh, content to simply just live out their lives according to the Commonwealth's constitution. Um, I found this uh, interesting note sort of predicting this kind of outcome that came out in 1893. Um, I'll read you this quote. Uh, the people of Belton sum it up by saying that Mrs. McWhorter is the center and soul of the organization, that its prolonged existence and success are due to her really extraordinary powers and to her strange influence over her followers, and that when she is gone, that will be the end of it. By 1908, there were only nine members left, um, Margaret Henry, Emily McEwen, uh, Fanny and Lizzie Holtzclaw, who were sisters, um, Gertrude and Martha Schiebel, who were mother and daughter, uh, Agatha Pratt, Josephine Rancier, and Leela Carter. In 1918, they sold uh, their property in Washington and lived exclusively at um, Commonwealth Farm in Colesville. By the early 1920s, when 
as more people owned cars, uh, Commonwealth Farm became a popular place for motorists touring the countryside. And its clientele um, included um, high society and influential Washingtonians. And uh, glowing descriptions of Commonwealth Farm started appearing in society columns. Um, so for example, there was a meeting of um, congressional wives in 1922 at Commonwealth Farm. And um, this is what they said about it. They called it a delightful old fashioned country place near Silver Spring with broad grassy slopes and beautiful large trees. And this, this next ex excerpt is from another society item. And uh, just so you know, it's a run on sentence as there's 37 words between the subject of the sentence and the verb. So bear with me on this. The tables, set under the trees and fairly groaning under the load of toothsome old Maryland dishes such as fried chicken and gravy, cornbread, tall pitchers of creamy buttermilk, and such ice cream as someone seldom tastes, was a picture long to be treasured. The farm was also a place where people would go in the summer to escape the heat of the city. So here's another item. Mrs. Harold is spending the summer out at the farm, a lovely old place on the Silver Spring Road where lunches or chicken dinners are served on order and which is becoming exceedingly popular with motor parties. And I, I looked at some of the organizations that held their meetings, at least the ones that showed up in the society columns. It was like the, the auxiliary of the order of the uh, Eastern Star, uh, the Massachusetts Society of Washington, and once there was the board of directors of the Central Savings Bank. And uh, form, famous visitors uh, included uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, cartoonist Clifford Berryman, um, Sam Rayburn, who was Speaker of the House, and uh, Supreme Court Chief Justice Fred Vinson. In 1927, a display ad appeared in the Wash, uh, no, the Evening Star, which featured a detailed description of the farm, including a 20 room, four bath house, woodland, an orchard, and acres of wheat, corn, and grass. And in the fine print, they, um, had a, they talk about what other assets they had, including livestock and outbuildings, and uh, even um, an ice box that could hold a ton of ice. And at the time the ad was placed, there were five members of the Commonwealth left and three of them were in their 70s. So you could kind of understand that they might be ready to retire. But for unknown reasons, the sale never took place. But on the other hand, this is really, it's very good to find this because this is the most detailed description I could find of um, Commonwealth Farm and the kind of enterprise it was, which was substantial. Oops, sorry about that. Um, at, so uh, Commonwealth Farm continued hosting guests and boarders and serving their famous country dinners uh, throughout the 1930s and into the 1940s. In 1940, with the death of Josephine Rancier, uh, only two members of the Women's Commonwealth were still living. Um, that was Leela Carter and Martha Schiebel. And the year before Rancier died, they had sold off 11.5 acres at the north end of the property um, to a couple named Oliver and Lorena Sweet. So, but in 1945, um, Carter and Schiebel bought that 11.5 track back, and then they built a home on it. And uh, then what happened was in 1947, they sold the farm except for that 11.5 acre tract, and uh, to Peter and Vivian Flores, who attempted to keep uh, Commonwealth Farm in um, open. And uh, this is a lovely illustrated um, postcard uh, showing you, it was a, looked like a, a beautiful place, um, but uh, I guess it didn't work out for the Floroses because in 1947, they, September 1947, they sold the property. And then the inn and restaurant were closed. The next thing that happened was that it was bought by um, Jesse Jolliffe. Um, 
she was a proprietor of two nursing homes in um, Tacoma Park and Silver Spring. And at this point, she sold off those two nursing homes so she could buy Commonwealth Farm. And then she placed this ad in uh, the Washington Post um, soliciting reservations for her new venture. And she then sought a permit to run a nursing home from the county. And after she installed um, fire escapes and um, she got a, a positive inspection from both the health department and the fire department, then she uh, started her business um, probably sometime in 1948 or 49. It's somewhere around there. Anyway, it, everything went okay for a couple years and then this happened. Um, on September 18, 1951, a fire broke out on the uh, one-story north wing of the uh, nursing home, and it was completely burned inside. And then the fire spread to the main house, um, and six rooms were destroyed there as well. Uh, it was a, probably a very chaotic thing that happened because the firemen were not immediately able to fight the fire because they had to evacuate all the patients. Uh, many of them were frail and some were confused by all the excitement and um, wandered back in the building when the firemen weren't looking. And one uh, patient actually fought off his the rescuers, which was kind of sad. And then a woman uh, insisted on going back to her room to retrieve her favorite chair. And uh, when the fireman finally reached that room, she was dead sitting in her favorite chair. So um, it was quite tragic. Um, and all four people died and 47 people were injured. And the cause was suspected to be smoking materials discarded in the linen closet. Um, anyway, in the lower right hand corner, you can see this aerial photograph. And I believe this is the the one story north wing where the fire started. So if this is the north side, that means that um, New Hampshire Avenue is over here running south to north. Um, on December 22nd, 1951, two months after the fire, the nursing home fully reopened. And as far as I know, it stayed open until at least through the end of 1953, possibly into 1954. And the reason I think that was I searched um, the newspapers um, for obituaries for people who died, you know, at uh, the nursing home. And the latest one that I could find was someone who died at the nursing home in Dece December of 1953. Let's talk now about how it went from a nursing home to a county park. This is sort of the timeline of things that happened. In 1955, Jesse Jolliffe closed the nursing home and she sold the property to Harry Gorin, who I think was probably a developer. In 1956, Leela Carter died. Uh, and so Martha Schiebel became the last living member of the Women's Commonwealth. The buildings were torn down in the 1960s, thereabouts. Um, the only evidence I have is of one person on Facebook who grew up in the area said she kind of recollected that's when um, the buildings were torn down. In 1971, Harry Gorin sold the property to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. 1988 was when Bonifant and Good Hope Roads were realigned to the north. Also in 1988, uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church sold it to a group of investors. And, you know, it's interesting that for such a large tract, and during all this time, nothing was ever built on it. In 1999, um, I believe, um, the property was subdivided into two tracts. Um, and I believe that the reason that this was, um, the county was getting ready to buy it and they wanted to spread the purchase over um, two budget years. So uh, I feel like this theory is borne out because um, the first tract was still sold on June 30th, 2000, which would have been the last day of the county's fiscal year. And the second tract was sold on June 30th, 2001. So that's my theory. 
The property where uh, Commonwealth Farm Inn uh, and restaurant once stood is now a county park called um, Upper Paint Branch Stream Valley Park. And north of Good Hope Road is still the 11.5 uh, acre tract um, that was um, that Martha Schiebel lived on. And it was subdivided some around 1993. And Martha's house still exists and it's on New Hampshire Avenue and on a 2.75 acre uh, lot and it's owned by, uh, it's a private residence now. And the remainder of that little tract um, was acquired by the county and it's now Peachwood Neighborhood Park. This is a photo that I took at the site of Commonwealth Farm Inn looking towards New Hampshire Avenue. And on the right side of this wall is, um, that's a leg of the driveway. Uh, if you remember in that uh, atlas I showed at the beginning of the talk, that U-shaped driveway, um, this is the Southern leg of it. And uh, also scatter, oh, and then just to mention also, you can see that building directly across New Hampshire Avenue and that's um, called First Alliance Church. Um, stone, brick and uh, concrete foundations and walls are still in evidence around the site of where the, uh, the inn used to be. Uh, the park property is undeveloped. Um, I think that the county buys up property that's adjacent to streams so that they can help with the water quality. Uh, but there's no trails or amenities. And so I, if you visit it, um, you do at your own risk. Um, and in the winter, I was able to approach the site through the woods. I parked on, there's a little pull-offs on um, Good Hope Road and I was able to walk through the woods, but this was in the winter and um, I didn't even try it in the summer. I imagine it would be quite overgrown. Martha Schiebel spent the rest of her life in this house on land that was once part of Commonwealth Farm and she took in borders and she lived frugally. When she died in 1983 at the age of 100, the estate was worth about $250,000, which in today's money is about $700,000. Um, in keeping with the constitution of the Commonwealth, the assets were left to um, Washington City Orphans Asylum, which is now known as Hillcrest Children and Family Center. Now, this makes me ask the question, uh, why did Commonwealth Farm end up largely forgotten? I believe it was because by the time, well, one of the reasons, by the time they got to Colesville, that there weren't that many of them left. But they also probably had grown weary of their treatment in the press and decided that they just wanted to keep a low profile. Um, after they were mentioned in that 1912 rural survey of Maryland, um, I couldn't find any mention of them in print until well after the, the group had died out. Many of the members of the Women's Commonwealth are buried at Rock Creek Cemetery in Washington in uh, section F, lot 13. And if you look at the map where the F is, uh, their, their lot, if you wanna go find it, which I did, uh, is right near the top of the F on this map. And this is a picture of their gravestone, which unfortunately is difficult to photograph, um, but this is the best I could do. Now, when Josephine Rancier died, um, in 1940, there was no more room for her in the plot. So she's actually buried at Union Cemetery on Spencerville Road in Burtonsville, Maryland. Commonwealth Farm was a refuge for a group of independent women at a time when society looked down on their uh, aspirations for self-determination and the right to vote. And their celibacy was derided as, you know, being a man, they were a man-hating club. And in one article I found, uh, they dismissed their interest in women's suffrage by referring to it as their hobby. Uh, nevertheless, they persisted. And, and while it's sad that the commune died out, I, I don't think of it as a, that it failed. It's just that uh, they never aspired uh, for a greater membership. And, you know, given their celibacy, it's not surprising that they 
they died out. Um, but they managed to forge an extended family based on their common values at a time when traditional marriage and organized religion had let them down. And their success at uh, taking control and living life on their own terms is something to be admired. And I have one more thing I want to talk about. This, um, this is a, what I call a research epilogue because it's, a, it's an interesting story about some of the research into them. Um, this book published in 1993 is a comprehensive look at the woman's commonwealth. Um, and the title, This Strange Society of Women, was taken, by, uh, taken from one of the articles um, published in 1902 by the Washington Times. Uh, the author, Dr. Kitsch, is uh, currently a professor of women and gender studies at Arizona State University. But Dr. Kitsch grew up in Montgomery County. And while she was researching an earlier book on um, celibate community, she discovered that the woman's commonwealth once owned property in Montgomery County. So she sent her mother to the county courthouse to see if she could find any information on Martha McWhorter or Commonwealth Farm or anything like that. And it was her good fortune that her mother was assisted by a clerk who knew all about it because she had a friend who was renting a room from Martha Shebel at the time. So through this border, uh, Dr. Kitsch was able to arrange an interview with Martha Schiebel, and it was only a few months before Martha Schiebel died in 1983. When Dr. Kitsch was finishing up this book, uh, she remembered the border and she decided to contact him and see if, um, you know, if Martha had left behind any papers. And he she got a hold of him and he said, oh, yes, tons of them, you know, and there were um, letters and photographs and deeds and receipts, just all kinds of material. It was like a researcher's dream come true. <laughs> so he sent her all those materials and she used them uh, to finish up this book. And um, then she donated the papers to the University of Texas at Austin, where you know, researchers today could go, go and use them. And uh, as soon as I feel safe to travel, I think I'll be going there myself. Um, although Commonwealth Farm is mentioned in the book, um, Dr. Kitsch didn't go into the same kind of detail I just did about it, um, partly because, um, I mean, I have the advantage of that she didn't have in 1993 of, you know, ancestry, uh, dot com and uh, digital newspapers and that sort of thing. But also her interest was really the feminist implications of, of a celibate commune. And mine obviously was about, you know, the local history and uh, of Commonwealth Farm. But nevertheless, I'm really um, thankful that she wrote this book because it helped me understand, you know, where they were coming from. And uh, I'm grateful to Dr. Kitsch for keeping the story of uh, the woman's Commonwealth alive. So that's what I have. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'd uh, love to hear them. Okay, well, thank you so much, Julianne. Give me one second to find out how I can get my video back. <laughs> well, I can see you. Okay, excellent, because I cannot see myself. So give me one second. <laughs> <laughs> Try to find myself here. Uh, what else I can do. Okay, well, I will, yeah, I am just floored by all the, <laughs> all of the dynamics of this. So I will, let me see. Oh, we have a common case at excellent presentation. Yeah, I think you've stunned myself and a lot of us into, into silence here just because it's just so <laughs> wild. Oh, um, I, I hope not. I, I really would like to hear what people think. Did you get any questions? Um, no, we just have the one comment so far that just says excellent presentation. And okay. I'm trying again to... I don't know can you if you can see the q and a's or not but uh yeah um well um let's see i could i can tell you a couple of things that um 
might interest you. Um, and I can tell you some of the questions I got at other presentations. And I remember being at one where people kept saying, uh, this one kept, woman kept pressing, you know, but didn't they have any interaction with like other churches? And I'm like, no, you know, they relied on their own, you know, dreams and revelations, and they really didn't have any use for other religions. Uh, another interesting thing and I found was that they did go out though and visit other um, communities like theirs. And I found a story that they had gone to a Shaker uh, community. And what was interesting about that, you know, Shaker communities, they're celibate, but they are, they're both genders are there and they're all celibate. Mm -hmm. And Women's Commonwealth was largely women. So it was right. different. But anyway, the story goes that Martha wasn't there for 24 hours before she was telling the woman, you know, you're kind of oppressed here, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was a very interesting insight on Martha. Yeah, absolutely. And I love what were you able to find out where how were much were they involved with the like the national women's suffrage movement or anything like that? Um, yeah, I found little snippets about okay. um, uh, I can't remember which member it was. I think it was Gertrude Schiebel, but she was a member. They, she was a member of a chapter of the women's suffrage. So they they did interact with people in that regard. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that's fascinating, and just it's says such a hidden gem of, of the history that you uncovered here. But there's so much more too, just with women's suffrage history. I know just from what we, you know, what I researched with Laurel, that there's just so much more to um and encounter and then you know tying in everything else with the with the commonwealth farm on top of it i think it just it just keeps making that story just even more fascinating so yeah. uh, we have one other question if you would talk maybe a little bit in terms of how the women were able to purchase property without having any type of male as you know the the point person or the lead the lead purchaser well, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. That's probably one of the things that if I could ever get to the archives in, in Texas and see, because they have the deeds there, but uh, some of them, their husbands died and then they inherited the property and then it was theirs outright. Um, but uh, I'm sure there was, it, it wasn't straightforward if the husband was still alive. So I'm not sure how that that worked out. One of the things was, like, again, it all comes back to Martha. She was such a strong person. So believe me, she, she got a deal for herself. Yeah, I mean, I'm she sure. wasn't going to let George tell her she couldn't have that house. Um, so um, yeah, it's, I know that's an incomplete answer, but that's the best I can do. I really would love to get to um, Austin and and sit and look at all those papers and learn yeah. more about, about their lives. Absolutely. And just, you know, the stories and all the people that you brought to life again, I think that's the next logical step in your progress. So hopefully, mm -hmm. you know, down the line, there'll be an addendum to your research and we can hear more about that. Uh, and that's kind of a similar comment we just had is, will you be publishing a series of articles or even a book to expand on the research you've done? Uh, they said your research is amazing. And if you have any other projects or publications coming up, please let them know. Oh, well, um, I would like to uh, write an article about it, but I haven't gotten around <laughs> to it. <laughs> but yeah, I, I have some ideas about that. Um, about other things that I do, I mentioned this to you, Anne, earlier, but I'll mess, mention it again. One of my biggest um, local history projects recently was I wrote a history of the Aspen Hill Pet Cemetery in Aspen Hill, Maryland, and it's over 100 years old. Um, it, there are 50,000 some pets buried there, but there are also over 50 humans who are buried there because they really wanted to be buried there with their pets. And so um, if you're interested in reading the history of it, because it's, it's just got a lot of uh, local and regional history, um, and some fun stories too, and some sad stories. But um, I have to have another website just for the pet cemetery, and it's uh, called petcemeterystories.net, and you can find out where to get a copy of the um, the history, or you can just email me. I'd be happy to hear from any of you all. 
Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you for that, Julianne. And yeah, your contact information is up there. We can pass it along uh, if you contact the Laurel Historical Society as well. And again, definitely check out Montgomery History. They're doing you know a lot of great work, and that's how we partnered up with Julianne. And she has other presentations, and there's other speakers uh, as well through Montgomery History. So there's there's a lot more to be uh, uncovered as as we kind of expand to the greater Laurel area. Uh, so I'll let you think about any other other questions, but I am going to uh, switch over. Uh, Julianne, I'm going to share my screen for just a second because I want oh. to make sure that we have uh, some. Let me see. I just here. did stop share on my. Okay, perfect. Uh, so I want to make sure that we have uh, just a few seconds here to talk about our um, upcoming events here. So hopefully everyone can see that uh, just very quickly this Sunday, we will be having our Children's Day at the museum. We're very excited to be able to have an in-person uh, live event uh, focusing on harvest history and the fall harvest through uh, an archaeological perspective and celebrating Native American Heritage Month. So it's free, it's open to the public. Uh, you'll be able to start at the pool room right across the street from the museum if you're interested. And we also have two uh, similar events coming up. Uh, for those of you who might not have seen it in the paper, especially for those of you on the Montgomery kind of side of Laurel, uh, in today's Laurel Leader, we did have an article featuring the art installation, the traveling exhibit on Edgar Allan Poe that we partnered with Poe Baltimore uh, to bring to Laurel. Uh, and it's fabulous. It's part of the admission or the free admission for the Laurel Museum. And as mm -hmm. part of that, we're going to have a performer do the works of Poe on November 28th, and then he's going to return the following week to do a Christmas carol. Uh, and all of this is from memory. So he does these works, uh, these dramatic recitations uh, from memory. So uh, the tickets are very inexpensive. Uh, and I'll put that link in the chat in just a few minutes. But those are two programs we have coming up at the end of this month. We also have our holiday open house the first week of December. Again, we're very excited to have the museum open again. We have our collectible ornament returning for 2021. We'll have light refreshments and just a great activity uh, or an opportunity to come out and get a head on holiday shopping and just uh, see the museum before we close for the end of the year. And we have one more uh, webinar coming up for the end of our speaker series. So in Laurel, we had this tradition of uh, the decorated uh, Chris Laurel's Christmas trees and uh, based on the iconic tree that was decorated by the Cocoon family for so many years. Uh, so we'll be talking about that and, and sharing stories and photographs and memories about that experience. And then if uh, you, ex uh, we, so if you um, are in Laurel and you want to come back uh, next year, we are going to be having our new exhibit opening in February. That's called What's Cooking Laurel. And we're going to be having a look at all of the restaurants, past and present, uh, presents, the recipes and community cooking in Laurel. Uh, so if you have any recipes to share or anything like that, please let us know. We'd love to feature it in next year's exhibit. Uh, and then just finally, we encourage you to connect with us. Uh, you can uh, become a member of the Laurel Historical Society or Montgomery History, uh, and as well as uh, making a donation for our virtual uh, presentations. Uh, and then if there's any other questions or follow up, you can contact uh, me at the Laurel Historical Society, uh, info at laurelhistoricalsociety.org. Uh, and remember that we have um, the museum is open and before I forget I will type everything that I just mentioned in the chat here and so you can click on all those links and uh, make sure that you stop and see us at the Laurel Museum we're open now Friday Saturday and Sunday from 12 to 4. So I am going to stop my sharing and I think we have answered all of our questions. We're just a few minutes over. I think we've taken care of everything in the chat. So I want to thank everyone for being with us tonight. I hope you have learned uh, a little bit more about the fascinating history of Commonwealth Farm and it just completely blew my mind. So Julianne, thank you so much for mm -hmm. being with us tonight and just sharing oh. this. And I just well, hope it inspires you. everyone to just dig more into our local history. Well, thank you for inviting me and thank you. I want to thank the audience for, I wish I could see you, but I know that you were listening and that, that really made me feel good. So uh, thanks a lot, everyone.
Okay, well, wonderful, Julian. Thank you so much again. Uh, just as a matter uh, of housekeeping, again, we invite you to connect with Montgomery History and the Laurel Historical Society. I'm going to stop recording now, which I probably should have done before I ran into all of my announcements. Uh, but anyway, it's right there and to visit the museums. And uh, we hope to see you soon. And everyone, thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us tonight. And hope everyone uh, has a uh, happy and healthy and safe rest of their evening. Thank you, everyone.